did Dewey uh, teach uh, bullshit all the time or did they not? <laughs> Hi guys, welcome on the channel. Uh, today we're uh, we're asking the question if what we taught in DOE was complete bullshit or not, because uh, in, in 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 the past years we taught in DOE that. Uh, oxygen is as narcotic as nitrogen, but the latest scientific uh, data points maybe into another direction. And I have today with me uh, Xavier Friday, uh, Freitag, sorry, uh, who is uh, a, um, a fellow GE instructor and researcher in, in the field in New Zealand. Good morning to New Zealand. It's uh, pretty late here. Um, welcome. Thank you, uh, Benjamin, for having me. Yeah. So uh, as I as I as I said before, um, you did some work on oxygen narcosis. So maybe introduce yourself shortly to the audience, and then we can just dive into the topic. Yeah. So I'm Xavier. I'm a research fellow at the University of Auckland, uh, and um, also an avid diver. Um, and over the past years, I've been um, trying to um, look at gas narcosis in, in all shapes and forms, including using nitrogen, of course. But uh, lately, we've also investigated the effects of oxygen. Um, so, yeah. When I when I recall uh, the the like GOE fundamentals material, um, yeah, there there are some slides, and in in the GOE courses, we always taught that. Uh, oxygen is as as I said as as narcotic as nitrogen. But yeah, what actually did you do? What did you find out? What was your your research paper that was that's getting a really hot topic in the last weeks? So I I have the feeling. Yeah. So the um, the literature itself is is quite conflicted, um, and it is a topic that has been in uh, research for many, many years. And, and there have been various studies looking at the effects of, of oxygen on the brain and see if it's narcotic or not. And based on the old idea that um, uh, oxygen is um, twice as soluble in, in olive oil as nitrogen is, it's always assumed that it would be uh, twice as narcotic as nitrogen. However, we know that oxygen um, is consumed in the human body. So the partial pressure of oxygen at cellular level is probably not as high as nitrogen is. And hence, it's always kind of assumed, oh, it's probably similar as, as nitrogen. The, pro the, the, the challenge is, is that um, be able to measure these really subtle effects, you need a measurement method that is really sensitive. And for nitrogen, that's relatively simple because we can expand the, the depth and hence the effect of nitrogen narcosis. And we can use psychometric tests uh, like simple math tests to capture the effect of nitrogen narcosis. However, if we want to use the same test for oxygen, we have run into the problem that we can't extend the depth of oxygen to similar depths as, as nitrogen, like 50 meters, to measure the effects of, of, uh, of narcosis because oxygen would be toxic at those depths due to the oxygen toxicity effect uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the brain. So up until now, it was really hard to measure these really subtle effects in the shallow depths that we can measure the effects of oxygen. So in our study, we used EEG, so the electrical signals of the brain and a, a sophisticated analysis method to capture these uh, really small changes that happen in the brain during narcosis. And we first did that with nitrogen. And um, so we had participants going to uh, 18 and 50 meters. And we saw a, a big change in the algorithm at 50 meters, while we only saw a, a small but significant change at, at 18 meters. So we repeat the study with oxygen inside the hyperbaric chamber with um, by bringing participants to 18 meters which is the maximum pressure we can go to in the chamber using pure oxygen, something I wouldn't recommend going diving because of the effects going underwater. Um, Apparently, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so the, the chance of oxygen toxicity um, in the water are far higher 
uh, than, um, than in the hyperbaric chamber. That's why we can do that safely inside the chamber. So in the chamber at 18 meters, we were able to um, measure um, EEG as well while breathing pure oxygen. And we saw, we, we, we didn't see that same change as we saw with um, nitrogen narcosis. So hence that gives us the idea at least that oxygen doesn't cause the same effects as nitrogen does um, at depth. Which is a, which is a great f finding because by now, so it depends on the association. Some associations believe that there is a difference. Do we believe that there's no uh, belief, but it's what we taught, that there's no difference. So basically you were right looking into the brain while people get like nitrogen or oxygen narcosis, which is great <laughs> to yeah. really look at the brain yeah. while you do, yeah. while you while you literally dive in, yeah. in the hyperbaric chamber. Is the hyperbaric chamber filled with oxygen or are people breathing from a mask? No, so the, the, the chamber oxygen? itself is, it's a multi-place chamber. Uh, so there, um, we, we had the participant and a um, uh, inside attendant, one of my colleagues uh, with the participant inside the chamber. Uh, and we, um, the chamber itself is filled with air to pressure. And then uh, the uh, participant was breathing um, oxygen through a uh, a mask that covers the mouth and, the, sorry, no. So the, the participant was breathing uh, from a regulator system with a mouthpiece in the mouth uh, with a nose clip on the nose. Okay, like normal in diving, like a normal regulator yes. or something like uh, that. The, okay. the only difference is, is that this has an exhaust regulator as well, because we don't want that oxygen to go into the chamber. So the exhaust sure, is yes. plumbed to the outside. Yeah, yeah, that makes perfectly sense because you don't want high pressure oxygen in the chamber while having electrical devices there. Exactly. The, basically, the, yes, exactly. There, there is an increased risk of fire. Um, so we don't want the oxygen percentage in the chamber to go up. So that's why we plumb the uh, regulators to the outside. Sure. So uh, in the end, as I understood uh, from from the study, you you made different trials, like you had one trial people breathing air on surface as a baseline. Yep. And then you had like oxygen, pure oxygen on the surface. And then you had like uh, 1.42 bar and 2.84 bar, basically. Uh, yeah, so, breathing. yeah, so we had participants in the breathing uh, air at the surface as a baseline measurement to kind of see what their state was without any of the exposures. Um, and then we had pure oxygen breathing at the surface, 1.4 and 2.8 atmosphere, so 4 meters and 18 meters. Um, and the surface one was just to rule out any effects of, of the chamber itself, um, so to see if there's already a change at the surface. Um, and then we uh, had 4 meters, because 1.4 is kind of the maximum we, we use in recreational diving, um, so that is a, a, a normal limit, and then we use 2.8 uh, as the absolute maximum we can go to uh, inside the chamber. Yeah, like in the hyperbaric chamber. Yes. So, and and um, for the divers, the interesting range is like 1.4, because this is what yeah. we do in like recreation diving and, and like technical diving, even just only 1.2. Um, so yeah. did you, uh, so what was the findings summed up in like 1.4. So what does it mean for a diver? So uh, does it mean that like uh, nitric 32 or something is the better, it is the better gas, but in terms of narcosis, is it better than like air? So, so we didn't see any changes at 2.8 and we didn't see any changes related to narcosis at, at 1.4 or for that matter on the surface. Um, so, no, so yes, um, from a narcosis perspective, Nitrox 32 um, reduces, although very slightly, um, your narcotic um, exposure um, yeah. Um, yeah. At, at 30 meters. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's exactly the question. So it's slightly. So how big is is the difference? Or do you think the the participants can like feel the difference? Do you really prob probably not. Um, because in the end, you're only reducing your, your nitrogen percentage by um, 11%. Um, so 
you probably will not feel the difference. Uh, it's similar like breathing air um, at, at 30 meters or at an equivalent depth of um, probably somewhere 24. Uh, yeah, I had to calculate it, but yeah, yeah. something like that. So, so and, 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 yeah, and it's in, equivalent in real diving, you don't, yeah. And, and, yeah. and it's equivalent depth. Um, you wouldn't feel the difference in narcosis between that depth and 30 meters. Yeah, you you wouldn't feel that. What do you think about uh, methods to evaluate the like the mental capacity, like uh, like the flicker frequency? So there there were some uh, experiments with the flicker frequency. Yeah. Uh, um, do you think that's that's a that's a good measure? That's a good proxy? <laughs> do you think it's complete <laughs> screwed up? It doesn't so, say anything. So so the problem so. So the critical flicker fusion frequency is a device that shows you a flickering light. And um, if the frequency is low enough, you will perceive it as being flickering. And if you increase the frequency, at some point you won't see it flickering anymore. And you will perceive it as a steady light, which is fortunate because there are a lot of lights flickering around us uh, at, at the net, a net frequency of 50 hertz. And if we would perceive them yeah, flickering, sure. it would be quite tiring the whole day. Um, so that that moment of um, change between perceiving it to see flickering to fusion is what we call the critical flicker fusion frequency, and um, we that there's multiple studies out there that show that that frequency is uh, changing due to uh, fatigue, um, awareness, um, and also narcosis. So, um, um, especially, and, and a, the, yeah, sorry. especially a group in, in Belgium has been quite active with this uh, methodology over the last probably 10 years or so, using it in the diving environment as well. And they showed a change at 30 meters um, that persisted after the dive using air. So they related that to nitrogen narcosis and saying, well, there is an effect of nitrogen narcosis at depth that uh, continues on the surface. And once you start breathing oxygen, that's gone. Um, they mm -hmm. also did a study where they uh, had participants breathing oxygen or air at depth. And they showed that there was um, no narcosis at depth um, compared to um, the air breathing. So, Based on all that research, you would say, well, potentially, yes, it can measure nitrogen narcosis. It, so, so that was one of our reasons we included it in our research as well, because we um, weren't sure that the EEG, the electrical sickness of the brain, and all the analysis that comes with that would actually be successful. So as, as kind of a safety fallback, we included um, the CFFF measure in our um, uh, studies as well. However, when we analyzed that, that information, we, at 50 meters, um, breathing air, we didn't see any change happening. And then we looked closer at the literature uh, and we didn't see, a ch there, there were multiple studies out there that didn't show a change in CFFF at 50 meters or even reversed to what you would have expected based on the 30 meter studies. So, one of the ideas is that oxygen affects your eye as well. So you get a better ah, vision see. when there is more oxygen in your eye, which might explain the effects that, because the partial pressure of okay, oxygen in air at 50 meters <laughs> is 1.3 as well, which might counteract all the narcosis effects. So this, this okay. is the complicated um, story of, of using CFFF in, 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 as a research method to measure only the effects of nitrogen narcosis because there are multiple things affecting it, making it quite a complicated measure, which doesn't help in using it as a consistent method of, of analyzing divers and the effects of nitrogen narcosis. 
Okay. What do you think? So I, I had a very interesting conversation with a student of mine who took a, a fundamentals class with me and he was uh, in the field too uh, and was, was doing research, was, uh, uh, was a medical doctor and he thought about, uh, a, instead of the CFFF, uh, to use, to let people play uh, like a reaction game. Like, do, do you know, him, uh, know the game Double? Where you no, like have that. to find, uh, yeah, it's an uh, so it's a I, I think it's a children game. So you have two two playing cards, and on the playing cards are like I don't know nine or ten items, mm -hmm. and only two items are the same, like two stars, two oh, like yeah. lobsters, two like ghosts, whatever, and you play against each other, and you have to point out the one that's d double. That's why the game is called oh, double. Yeah. Uh, and you could measure the reaction time. You could even yeah. implement it on like in like in like in waterproof iPad or something yep. or a tablet, and you could play it underwater. Do you think that would be a valid method, or do you do you think you could uh, see any difference in like the mental capacity, the reaction time to a game like this, <laughs> which is like more realistic? Or uh, or it resembles more the real situation underwater that I have to think and do stuff like just the EG pattern. So yeah, they're, they're, these are um, the, the 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 game you just described are quite similar to all the different psychometric tests that are out there. Yeah. So in order to yeah. use a psychometric test, you first have to validate it to make sure that it actually captures the impairment that you want. <clears throat> um, and then you can use it in, in nitrogen narcosis research. So if you make the nitrogen narcosis um, severe enough by going deep enough, you will find a, a, a change. The, the, sure, the but you can't is, do that with oxygen, right? <laughs> um, so the challenge is if you can make it sensitive, if, if the test is sensitive enough, so co complicated enough for the human to perform, that it will capture the, the really subtle effects of nitrogen narcosis at shallow depths. Um, and if that happens, then you can test it on oxygen to see if there's a, um, a decrease as well or an increase, uh, because there are some studies that show that by having an increased amount of oxygen in your brain, you perform better. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. So, at the end of your of your paper, you wrote that, uh, however. Uh, there's maybe no uh, no nar narcotic effect due to oxygen, but it might increase the excitability. So what does that mean for the divers? <laughs> so we developed a second um, analysis method, which ac ac was actually our first analysis method that we used for nitrous oxide laughing gas um, to measure the effects of that um, outside of the hyperbaric chamber because doing experiments inside the chamber is quite complicated. Um, so being able to do that outside of the chamber um, is, is for setting up all the studies was, was um, way more convenient, uh, but you need a, a narcotic gas that's strong enough. And so we looked at the literature and we found that there were qu quite a lot of comparisons between laughing gas and nitrogen narcosis. So that's why we thought that laughing gas was a good idea to use um, as, a, as a narcotic agent, as a substitute, instead of going inside the hyperbaric chamber first. So we developed an analysis algorithm for that and found a um, dose-response relationship between nitrous, nitrous oxide and uh, the EEG analysis we did. When we did the nitrogen narcosis experiments, we didn't see a change happening in that algorithm, and that's why I developed the algorithm that we use for the nitrogen narcosis studies. And then we looked at the literature. Um, on the cellular level, um, nitrous oxide behaves differently. It binds to other receptors on your neurons, okay. your brain cells, mm -hmm. than nitrogen does. So probably, although they both have the same effect of causing um, cognitive impairment, they do it if, using a different pathway. Um, so that's why um, we developed a, a different algorithm. So when we did the oxygen analysis and we didn't see a change happening um, in with the with the algorithm that we used for the nitrous, nitrogen study, we also applied the nitrous oxide algorithm, and that's where we did see a change. And there is some really recent research out there that shows that oxygen binds to the same 
receptor, the NMDA receptor, um, as, as nitrous oxide did. So that's why we applied the algorithm and we did see a change uh, in that algorithm. And we think that, but that's, that's a hypothesis that we would like to investigate further, is that it might uh, cause hyperexcitability in the brain. So basically your brain cells become more active, but to a point that they, be, it's, it's a first step towards um, chaos basically, um, where the, 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 the brain cells are not talking correctly with each other anymore, which causes cognitive impairment. But if Is that maybe the path that leads to oxygen toxicity? Like yes. To so, so all, that, the, all the effects yeah. we know from oxygen toxicity, like twitching yeah. and, 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 and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so, so that's our hypothesis, that the hyperexcitability um, that, we, um, that we measured with this algorithm might lead to oxygen toxicity. Um, and that's um, something we are hoping to investigate um, relatively soon to see if, if we can um, get... So, so there is a group in Duke University in the US that recently completed a study where they um, uh, had people breathing pure oxygen at 10 meters inside a hyperbaric chamber for two hours where to, to inflict oxygen toxicity. Um, and they recorded EEG as well. So we're currently working towards a collaboration where we can analyze their EEG data to see if we can um, detect um, oxygen toxicity and predict when it would happen by see, uh, hopefully seeing a change in the EEG before the actual symptoms happen. Okay, very interesting, very, very interesting. Um, how can people be your guinea pigs? <laughs> so, how can people, so because you need participants yes, to, to yes. work on, can, so where do you get the people from? So we have a quite active diving community here in, in New Zealand and a, a quite active technical diving community as well. So whenever I launch one of our studies and I let a couple of the dive centers know and I post it on, on the Facebook uh, technical diving group here in New Zealand, um, within days I have my participants lined up and they're all really keen to participate in our studies, which is <sighs> exceptional. I'm, I'm really glad um, that it is that our community is that interested in our research and willing to help us out because without participants, we can't do these studies. Sure. And normally in studies, you will have to pay the people money and you have to do a whole lot of stuff so, to get people involved. But yeah, luckily we have a very active community, uh, not only in GUE, but in technical diving yeah. in general, I think. It's not only yeah. that GUE has the greatest community we have, but <laughs> so it's a wider community. It's not only limited yeah. to GUE. So. Yeah. So there are some GUE divers that participate in our studies, but there uh, are are technical divers from other organizations as well that are really keen um, to participate in our study. So yeah, we're really fortunate to have such a active diving community. So, so um, for these studies that we've been only using technical divers um, because we are doing decompression dives and we using uh, uh, oxygen for decompression. Um, sure. So in order to make it easier for us to explain the risks of um, what is involved in doing these, participating in these studies. We um, used only technical divers. So yeah, it was amazing having those people coming in and, and participate. Yeah, quite frankly, I was thinking all the time, uh, how are the guys from the ethics committee doing? <laughs> because doing all that studies with like people, like really humans, uh, I don't know. Okay, they are, they are, uh, uh, they do it voluntarily, of course, yeah. but uh, so, uh, so is it, it a is, challenge to like get the ethics committee? It is a rigorous uh, process for good reasons. Um, so we yeah. have to come up with what we want to do, why we want to do it. So there needs to be a good reason why we want to expose people to these depths, uh, to these risks that are involved in doing such dives. And then we identify the risks and come up with mitigation strategies. So we do, we use the DCIM tables for decompression because they are considered the most safe, the most conservative tables that are out there. Um, so yes, our decompressions are long and boring. 
Um, but at least you can <laughs> read a book while you're sitting inside the dry hyperbaric chamber. Um, and uh, and we have medical staff available um, on on during the the, the the parts that we consider to be uh, more at risk. So if needed, um, they can intervene. So yeah, it, it, it is a rigorous process, but um, as long as you explain the risks well and are able to come up with mitigations, it, ethics are fine with doing such studies. Uh, what's what's your what's your current recommendation for a book to read during very long de decompression <laughs> stops? Um, uh, uh, so the, the um, yeah, my, so my um, colleague uh, Hannah van Waard has been in the chamber quite a lot um, over the last couple of years. So she's been reading uh, the books um, about the Thai cave rescue that came came out. Um, so the okay. um, the book by uh, Craig Shellen and uh, Richard Harris, and um, by the two um, uh, UK guys as well. And she recently started on uh, you, uh, reading the book of uh, Garrett Locke um, about under pressure about human factors. So yeah, yeah. Um, awesome, awesome. Yeah. And you can always reread a blueprint for survival anyway. <laughs> you can always Absolutely. read that. Absolutely, yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> Absolutely. So, hand to the heart. Do we need to change uh, the SOP in GUE? Do we need to change what we what we used to teach? Do we need to change that, or can we leave it as it is? Because the 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 differences are only very subtle. Yeah. So, I think we can. Uh, we can change what we teach saying that um, oxygen might not be narcotic. So at least be explicit about it that the research is um, conflicted and that it, um, based, on, based on at least my research, we can say that oxygen is probably not narcotic in the same way as nitrogen is. However, if we then want to change, for instance, um, the maximum depth of um, of of um, of gases, I don't think we should change that because there are more things at play than just um, the, the equivalent narcotic depth. Um, for GUE, a, a, a really important part of, of the maximum depth of our gases is the gas density. Um, and those don't change due to uh, being Absolutely oxygen, not, not narcotic. <laughs> so based on that, I would say probably we won't change what we actually do but we might change what we teach regarding oxygen narcosis. Yeah, maybe, maybe we change what we explain. And still being so thinking that oxygen is narcotic, but it is not, it's just even more conservative. So you could probably just leave it as it is and just yeah. tell yeah. people tell people that the science behind tells something different. It's just an approximation, like we have a lot of approximations in our yeah. GOE. Uh, teaching in general when it comes to like like cat formula all that kind of stuff is like an approximation yeah and that we just try to be on the conservative side conservative with our enough. approximations yeah, exactly um so there's nothing wrong with saying that oxygen is similar narcotic as, as nitrogen because that's more conservative than um saying it is not narcotic so there's nothing wrong with it it's just um being more correct in saying that oxygen might not be narcotic. Sometimes you have students that are really uh, who are really interested, and I I started sending them your paper, <laughs> just the <laughs> link to read it, uh, and telling them it's this uh, maybe it's half the truth, but it's not harming in any way how we teach it. But if you want to know the truth and you're you're really interested, read that paper. And there's a lot of of of, of stuff out there. So yeah. yeah, very luckily we don't <laughs> need to change anything. Uh, we just need to change the way we explain the science behind it. Yes. Uh, behind it to students who are interested and the students who are not really interested in the science, we can leave everything yeah. like it was. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Very, <laughs> very good. Very good. So it wasn't complete bullshit what we taught, but it was not scientifically 100% correct. But it was even more conservative. Yeah. So we can yeah. sum that up. Everything stays as it is, just even more conservative. Um, and of course, nitroc 32 is the better breathing gas compared to air. Once more. 
It, yes, it, it is, has a, a slight advantage in, in your um, in your narcotics. Tiny, yes. Yes. But, yeah, yes. But it has a lot of advantages in other terms, like decompression and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So maybe it's slightly slightly better in terms of narcosis, but it has a lot of advantages. That's why we Absol still absolutely. say the, the, dive 32. Yeah, the, the main advantage of using nitrox 32 is, is its decompression advantage compared to air. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. What's your next big project? So what is the next things we can hear about or read about and then get a, being a hot topic for the <laughs> next, like, 2023? What's, so, what's the, the research of 2023? So we recently completed a study where we um, had participants breed high levels of, of CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, oh. um, at the surface, but also under pressure combining it with, with nitrogen uh, narcosis. So um, there has been quite a lot of research in the past, or a couple of studies at least, um, looking at the interaction between um, hypercapnia, so the increased amount of CO2 and nitrogen narcosis. Um, so now that we have this really um, sensitive analysis method using EEG, we want to repeat those studies and see if we can measure um, the, the interaction between those two gases. So we're currently in the analysis phase of, of that data set. Um, so hopefully um, in 2023, we finish the analysis and the write-up and, and we'll, you'll probably hear more from us about that. Um, and we're currently in the process of um, uh, recording EEG at 70 meters inside the chamber. So a really deep dive um, to further expand our data sets on nitrogen narcosis. Because we, we saw a change at 18, um, a, a moderate increase at 50 meters, and now we want to see if there's a linear increase at, at 70 meters. Um, and that also expands our, our data set, because these experiments we only do with 12 participants, because they're quite <coughs> complicated experiments to do. So having more people coming through, we can also expand our, our data set with different people and see if it still holds true for a larger group. Interesting and very important, for, especially for the CCR guys, uh, and uh, where where CO two is really a nasty thing, and yeah. so it's it's even even more important. And yeah, I'm 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 really pumped to 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 read the data and 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 read yeah. the papers as they come out. Uh, very interesting. Yeah, and, and hopefully in the future we work towards a. Um, monitoring methods uh, and pr pr probably it will first be more in for technical for for military and commercial divers because they at least some of them use a hard head helmet which kind of creates a dry environment where it's easier to put an EEG electrode in than in a wet environment um and and come up with a system that can monitor continuously real time a diver while they're doing their job uh, because the problem with all these psych psychometric tests is that they are distractors. They can't do their job. So it's purely interesting for sure. si for a scientific study, where um, if you have if we can get to get it to a point where we can do the EEG analysis real time, we can have divers just doing their normal thing underwater that they need to do, where that why they're there, and it gives the supervisor of the diver not another level of, of monitoring how the diver is doing and hopefully um, warn the diver if they are experiencing um, narcosis um, and, and hopefully uh, not making mistakes due to that. Yeah, that's interesting, like having real-time monitoring of narcosis, yeah. warning divers. Uh, and of course, that would be interesting in, in, in really deep technical diving as well, but as you said, if, if it's it's hard to get that in a wet environment, yeah. of course. That, that would be amazing if we can get to the point where we can deploy this um, inside a hood. Um, you just pull over a hood over your head and go diving and it yeah, monitors you get, your brain. Um, but you I get, think you would get a really high-selling hood. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and it will probably be more um, a, a couple more years away than than the real-time algorithm that will we need for that first. So step by step, we'll, we'll work towards that, but that might be further away than we 
um, than we than, than we're planning for now. Maybe maybe more people have to get the the standard Dewey haircut like like <laughs> like I do. It, 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 <laughs> It does make it easier recording EEG if there's not much hair on the head. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm really looking forward to get like a hood uh, with all the EEG recordings, uh, like on my dev computer on the on the controller of, of the of the CCR, seeing like you're running into CO2 narcosis now. <laughs> stop or do something. That would be yeah. awesome. But yeah, it's it's something yeah, and, of the very far far future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it is, well, first now we're working towards nitrogen narcosis. Um, but indeed, it can be hopefully a multi-algorithm sensitive to the different um, gases that might influence uh, our, our diving, including uh, oxygen toxicity, hypercapnia, nitrogen narcosis, uh, and maybe even a high pressure nervous syndrome at some point. Exactly. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would be awesome because yeah. maybe it's not for the average technical diver, but if you do really deep dives and you're doing it, yeah. pushing it really far beyond, then yeah, uh, HPNS might be a problem, and and it's good to. Yep. Yeah, it would be awesome to have a real time warning mechanism. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting, really interesting, and yeah, I'm really pumped to see more of your work and maybe have a nice talk again uh, sometime. Uh, Absolutely uh, about the topics because it's always interesting, and I think it's uh, especially like for for viewers on YouTube very interesting to to really get this first hand information. Uh, yeah, like an interview like this, talking to the people that really do <laughs> the science behind it. Uh, and that maybe shapes the the future of diving agencies, of the way we teach and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very important work. And yeah, I'm really, really excited uh, yeah, to, to talk to you again. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much for this really, really interesting talk and very uh, interesting insights in your work. Uh, absolutely great. Yeah, thanks for having me and allowing me to explain the research in probably a slightly easier way than reading the paper because it's it's quite technical of reading course. the paper. Of course, that's the reason why I I, I thought it might be interesting for people to to watch yeah. it like in an interview instead of reading the paper. But I yeah. just linked the paper uh, in the description absolutely. so people can read it and maybe there's further information and yeah you. Yeah. Yeah, and the, I think that everything that, and people that's can read recently it. published um, will will pro probably be a good read as well um, as an intermediate step before reading the paper. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Great for for having you here, and I hope yeah we can do it again. Absolutely, more than uh, happy to um, explain the next bit of our research. Thanks. <laughs> And uh, yeah, have a have a good day in New Zealand, and uh, I go to bed now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have a good night. <laughs>